It's always been clear that plants need light to grow, but researchers have only recently determined exactly how it's used. Even quite simple observations can tell us something about plant chemistry. All plants exposed to light give off a gas. The gas is oxygen. The plant uses light and water in a light harvesting reaction, which liberates oxygen. It's also easy to show that light is intimately involved in the synthesis of starch within the leaf. Boil the leaf in alcohol to remove the green pigment. Add iodine, which forms a black complex with starch and the leaf only darkens where it was illuminated. So light plays a role in the fixation of carbon dioxide to form starch. It does this through the light harvesting reaction, which produces two chemicals, ATP and NADPH, which are consumed in the carbon fixation reaction. Leaves are green because the pigment they contain absorbs all the other colours that make up sunlight. This green pigment is confined to the subcellular organelles called chloroplasts, and the rest of the cell appears white, indicating that it doesn't absorb light. This transmission electron micrograph shows that the chloroplast is full of bundles of filaments. These filaments contain the green pigment chlorophyll, and they are extensions of the chloroplast's inner membrane. Seen in three dimensions, they form stacks of interconnected compartments called thylakoids. The medium that surrounds the thylakoids is called the stroma. Can we prove that this chlorophyll within the thylakoid membrane is capable of storing the energy of sunlight? Illuminate the chloroplast with invisible ultraviolet light, then turn off the white light. This fluorescence shows that chlorophyll is trapping ultraviolet light and temporarily storing its energy before emitting it as a light of a different wavelength. Under natural conditions, rather than fluorescing and so wasting the trapped light energy, chloroplasts use it in photosynthesis. This first light harvesting step involves chemical changes across the thylakoid membrane. And we can show this in simple experiments performed here in the biology department of Imperial College London. Hello, Alison. Alison Telfer has been engaged in photosynthesis research for several years now. So where do we start? Well, first of all, we need a suspension of isolated thylakoids. It's fairly simple to break down plant material in a blender then centrifuge and separate the chloroplasts from the other plant fractions. When diluted in water, the chloroplast membrane ruptures, effectively releasing isolated thylakoids. And that's the reaction vessel you're going to use? Yes, inside. It's very similar to this vessel. The diluted thylakoid suspension is constantly stirred and surrounded by a water jacket to keep it at a constant temperature. And of course, we have a light source which can be switched off, and other ports for different measuring probes. In the first experiment, we fitted an oxygen electrode to see if the thylakoids produce oxygen in the light. Its output is plotted on this screen as oxygen evolution against time. Oxygen is liberated something which is not achieved in similar experiments with other plant fractions. This is due to the decomposition of water, two molecules of water producing oxygen gas. But what of the hydrogen? 
hydrogen gas is not formed, so the production of oxygen should be accompanied by the formation of hydrogen ions, protons. So in our next experiment, we've incorporated a pH electrode to detect any change in the hydrogen ion concentration. But it isn't as you might have expected. The pH has increased, indicating a drop in the hydrogen ion concentration in the solution surrounding the thylakoids. By implication, the protons have been hidden away somewhere, perhaps inside the thylakoid compartment. To test this, we can modify our experiment by including a chemical called an uncoupler, which makes the membrane very permeable to protons, so the protons can't be hidden away. What would you expect to happen to the pH and oxygen production when the uncoupler is added? The continued production of oxygen shows that water is still breaking down, but now, with the integrity of the thylakoid membrane destroyed, we can see that the pH rise was due to the formation of a proton gradient across the membrane. But does the proton gradient have any importance in photosynthesis? To answer this question, we need to engage in little lateral thinking. Remember that overall, photosynthesis combines water and carbon dioxide to give starch and oxygen. As in the body, this synthesis requires adenosine triphosphate. Can we show that ATP is produced by the thylakoids? Fireflies glow because they contain a pair of substances, luciferin and luciferase, which convert the chemical energy of ATP into light. We can use a light liberated by the luciferin luciferase to indicate the presence of ATP. To monitor the production of light, we've had to modify our experimental apparatus. A photomultiplier is attached, which will only measure light of the wavelength produced by luciferin. We've also filtered the light source so that it doesn't contain those wavelengths. So what happens when we illuminate the thylakoid suspension in the presence of luciferin luciferase? With the light source on, light is produced by luciferin. But turn it off, and luciferin stops emitting. So, ATP is produced when thylakoids are irradiated with light. But has this anything to do with the production of a proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane? Now we'll turn the light source on again and see what happens when uncoupler is added. As the proton gradient collapses, the light emission, indicating ATP production, falls. Still, the production of ATP might be due to some other process fueled by light, but which requires an intact thylakoid membrane. To test this, in the absence of light, we can add base to the surrounding solution and artificially create a proton gradient. The luminescence demonstrates that a proton gradient alone produces ATP. It falls off rapidly because the pH gradient is consumed by the ATP production. This mechanism for the production of ATP proves that establishing a proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane is absolutely necessary for the photosynthetic production of ATP. Now let's recap on what we've established so far. Light falling on the thylakoid causes water to break down. Two molecules of water forming one molecule of oxygen, four hydrogen ions or protons, and four negatively charged electrons. The oxygen is liberated from the thylakoid and is eventually lost to the atmosphere. The increase in pH of the medium outside the thylakoid membrane shows that protons are more concentrated on the inside of the membrane. By implication, the electrons must be nearer the outside of the membrane. This proton gradient is responsible for the production of ATP from its precursors. Once formed, the ATP can be used in the synthesis of carbohydrates or in other biosynthesis elsewhere in the plant. So far, though, we have no indication of how NADPH is formed. The essence of this system is that it first achieves the breakdown of water, then manages to keep the protons and electrons apart so they don't immediately recombine, reversing the process. We'll be seeing what the latest research has to tell us about how this is achieved.
But first, let's concentrate on how the thylakoids harvest light. The thylakoid membrane contains clusters of chlorophyll molecules. Each cluster contains several hundred molecules and acts like a funnel. Any of these chlorophyll molecules can be excited by a photon of light. The excitation energy passes randomly between the chlorophyll molecules in what is known as the antenna, but eventually it reaches a special pair of chlorophyll molecules, a dimer, at the heart of the reaction center on the inside of the thylakoid membrane. So we can think of the clusters of chlorophyll molecules in the thylakoid membrane as a series of antennae, each channeling light energy to its reaction center on the inside of the thylakoid membrane. Now we can turn to the knowledge of the mechanism of the reaction center that has been established over the last 20 years or so. Professor Jim Barber heads the photosynthesis research group here at Imperial College. Now, Jim, the most important breakthroughs haven't come from plant photosynthesis, have they? You're right, Paul. In, in actual fact, the pioneering work was carried out with uh, photosynthetic bacteria because it was found that you could isolate from this type of organism uh, a reaction center complex free of antenna chlorophylls. That, that wasn't possible to do with higher plants at that time. And with, when you have that sort of reaction center isolated in the test tube, if you like, then you can apply a whole range of spectroscopic techniques. And indeed, people will use these sorts of techniques to study the electron transfer processes. For example, picosecond laser spectroscopy was used, and that allows you to study reactions that take place on the time scale of a millionth, millionth of a second. And from that type of measurement, the reaction pathways were worked out. But I might say that did not give information about how the components were arranged in these pathways. Right. So let's look what came out of these studies. Excitation is passed through the antenna complex to excite the bacteriochlorophyll dimer. This excitation enables an electron to be released by the dimer and passed to an adjacent bacteriotheophytin molecule. This happens in the incredibly short time of four million millionths of a second. Then, in an exchange of some 50 times slower, the electron is transferred to a quinone molecule, QA, eventually in a step some 100,000 times slower, a cytochrome molecule moving freely in the solution inside the membrane approaches the positively charged dimer and donates an electron, neutralizing the dimer. The initial charge separation across the membrane initiated by the excitation is completed by the transfer of an electron from quinone A to another nearby quinone, B. The overall process of this charge separation takes less than a thousandth of a second. By using the excitation to create a charge separation that moves in progressively slower steps away from the reaction center, an effectively one-way system is formed which regenerates the center and stops the process reversing. Well, that was the picture until quite recently. But in 1982, Hartmut Mikkel isolated crystals from the Rhodopseudomonas bacteria reaction centers. How important was this, Jim? Well, it, it was it came incredibly important when he teamed up with two X-ray crystallographers, uh, Dysenhofer and Huber, at the same institute, and they were able to, within actually just within three years, they solved the complete structure of this reaction center, and this was. A magnificent piece of science because it meant for the first time we had a structure of a membrane protein but also as far as for us who work in photosynthesis it told us how the components which are involved in the electron transfer processes are organized within this protein complex this work was recognized very rapidly as being outstanding and in 1988 uh, the three workers were awarded the Nobel Prize for chemistry this computer display of the structure of the reaction complex of Rhodopseudomonas viridis is based on X-ray crystallographic coordinates. Most of this structure consists of three protein chains, and while these are not directly involved in the charge separation, they provide the environment in which the reaction center of the photosystem works. And of course, the whole reaction complex is held within a lipid membrane. But we need to concentrate on the reaction center, so we'll ignore the protein chains. For all that the crystal structure shows the reaction complex to consist of two remarkably similar sides, the excited electron only passes up the A side. 
It passes from the bacteria chlorophyll dimer, past the spectator chlorophyll, to the bacteriotheophytin on the A side, then onto the quinone on the same side. Finally, the electron passes via the protein occupying the center of the complex to the quinone on the B side. The next excited electron follows the same path, and despite the apparent similarity of the quinones, only quinone B is able to accept two electrons. This is almost certainly due to the different environments produced by the proteins that enclose the reaction center. The role of the bacteriotheophytin on the B side remains an enigma. The importance of this knowledge of the workings of the bacterial reaction center is that very similar components are found in one of the photosynthetic centers in the thylakoid membrane, known as photosystem two. What we've shown you so far is only the first step in utilizing the photon's energy. Now we can look at what use is made of the charge separation in plant photosynthesis. But first, Jim, just how comparable are the thylakoid and bacterial photosystems? Well, they're actually remarkably similar, perhaps more similar than one would have imagined several years ago. This is particularly, the similarity is particularly found on the quinone side, on the reducing side. However, of course, on the oxidizing side, that is on the, ex on the donor side, the, there are, the, there are qu considerable differences. Here in the higher plant system, you have a sort of manganese complex which binds water and acts as an electron donor. And that replaces the cytochrome that you would have in the bacterial system. The photon-induced charge separation in photosystem two follows a similar pattern to that in the bacterial system, except that the bound manganese complex, which in turn binds two water molecules, can donate up to four electrons to the chlorophyll dimer. Once two photons have excited two electrons and produced two negative charges at quinone B, QB2 minus reacts with water in the stroma producing hydroxyl ions and a QH2 molecule, which migrates into the membrane and is replaced by a quinone from a pool of quinones residing in the membrane. Now the system is regenerated and can receive two more photons. These produce another Q2 minus, which reacts with water to give QH2 and hydroxyl ions. Meanwhile, the manganese water complex forms four protons inside the thylakoid compartment and finally releases a molecule of oxygen, which diffuses out of the plant cell. This is only the first stage in generating the proton gradient. Now let's consider the fate of the QH2 molecules. These hydrophobic molecules migrate down through the lipid membrane until they meet a receptor on a cytochrome complex near the inside surface of the thylakoid compartment. Here, QH2 releases two protons and two electrons. One electron passes up through the cytochrome complex to another quinone, which it reduces to Q minus. The other electron passes to a plastocyanin. The reduced plastocyanin, PC minus, then leaves the complex and is replaced by an uncharged, oxidized plastocyanin. The complex can now receive a further QH2 molecule. This liberates further protons and a reduced plastocyanin in the thylakoid compartment. And a second electron reduces Q- to form Q2-, which reacts with water in the stroma, giving hydroxyl ions and a QH2, which migrates into the membrane and is replaced by a quinone from the pool. The QH2 in turn finds its way to the lower receptor where it releases protons into the thylakoid compartment and produces another reduced plastocyanin. So, the migration of QH2 across the membrane and its reaction with the cytochrome complex further increases the proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane. The reduced plastocyanins migrating within the thylakoid compartment give up their extra electron to a second photosystem known as photosystem one. In a similar way to that in photosystem two, the energy of a photon received through the chlorophyll antenna excites this electron. But here the excited electron passes to a ferrodoxin molecule, which it reduces. <laughs>
the reduced ferrodoxin is released into the stroma and replaced by an unreduced ferrodoxin. Meanwhile, the reduced ferrodoxin remigrates to a flavor protein held on the thylakoid membrane. This acts as a reaction center where an NADP plus ion is first reduced to NADP. Then by a further reduced ferrodoxin to NADP minus, which reacts with a proton from the water in the stroma to give NADPH, which is released into the stroma inside the chloroplast. Elsewhere in the thylakoid membrane, there are what might be called proton channels. When a sufficient proton gradient exists across the membrane, these will transport protons to the outside of the membrane. This flow of protons liberates energy, which is used to convert ADP to ATP. Thus, in the light harvesting process, the photosynthetic reaction centers and associated centers combine to use the light's energy to produce ATP and NADPH. So these processes are light dependent. The energy and reducing power stored in ATP and NADPH fuel the fixation of carbon, which is light independent. These light independent reactions regenerate ADP and NADP+, which are recycled through the photosynthetic system to produce further ATP and NADPH. Well, that completes our look at the light harvesting side of photosynthesis. Jim, what are the implications of this work in understanding the evolution of higher plants? Well, without doubt, the, it's quite clear that the photosystem II reaction center has evolved from the purple bacterial system. There's no doubt about that now, which is an amazing fact, actually, because photosystem II was called photosystem II because it was thought that that evolved later in evolution. And what is starting to emerge is that photosystem one uh, is very similar to the reaction center found in a, another class of photosynthetic bacteria known as green bacteria. So what seems to have happened in evolution is that green bacteria and purple bacteria have come together uh, to form, uh, by some sort of symbiotic relationship, I suppose, to form the modern uh, uh, photosystems that we now call today photosystem one and photosystem two. The fact that we now have molecular details, atomic resolution in actual fact, of the reaction centers of the bacteria means that one can understand precisely how a whole range of herbicides which are used in agriculture um, uh, operate by binding into the QB site. They bought these, these compounds, a whole range of them, bind into the QB site, stop electron transfer. And by knowing, having that sort of knowledge, we can now understand precisely why some weeds develop resistance to these herbicides. And on top of that, which is perhaps even more important, is that the engineer, the protein engineer, can start to design or new types of crop varieties in which he specifically engineers a, an amino acid within, in this case, the photosystem II reaction center in the QB pocket, so that you can have crops which are resistant to herbicide. And that means you can spray those crops with that herbicide. And at the same time, you won't kill the crop, but you'll kill the weeds which are surrounding the crop.